Well, that's my deepest passion, is the, uh, what we can know about God through, through reason, uh, through the use of our own intelligence, through uh, self-questioning, coming to know who we are ourselves. Um, and I wrote about this book as one of my first books in 1965, uh, Belief and Unbelief, uh, a course which when I get a chance to teach, I still love to teach, though I'm you know, at a research institute now, not teaching. And, and then later, some years later, a book called The Experience of Nothingness, dealing especially with the problem of uh, why is it that nihilists write books? I mean, if there's no meaning to anything, and it's all absurd and chaos and relative. And they certainly write with a passion for honesty and, and uh, courage. They're always praising courage. And, and writing books is a great act of community. So it seems to me, in the heart of nihilism, there's a powerful positive ethic of honesty and courage and, and community. It's, it's not enough ethic to carry you all through life. It doesn't tell you much about men or women, for example. But, um, uh, or children, you know, uh, there's a lot you have to learn. But nonetheless, it's, it's the root of a powerful ethic. Um, and I thought, I was hoping some university or institution would invite me to give a set of lectures so I could revisit these problems again, and that wasn't happening, so I had you know, certain ideas and tentative explorations. And the outbreak of the new atheist books, uh, I wanted to avoid it because I wasn't, my idea wasn't to reply to them so much, but they provided the occasion for me uh, getting back in, and for that reason I'm very grateful to them. They raised some good objections that uh, forced believers to think and rethink, and, um, and that's all to the good. So um, I love that problem, and I think I've enjoyed working on this book as much as any in my lifetime. And I wanted it to be very good because it's my last one, maybe. You know, I always think that way now that I'm 75. Do the best I can, but who knows when it's, when it's over. What I, there are a couple reviewers who have said of it what pleased me the most, that they're atheists. And this book um, strengthened them in their atheism. But they appreciated the chance to think each problem through. They were, they were, this journey, this climb up the mountain, whatever you want, takes a lot of twists and turns and into valleys and so forth. You know, the mind is, is, is many mountains. And, um, and they appreciated making that voyage. And that's my idea, that, uh, that believers and unbelievers, um, um, I'm not talking about Judaism and Christianity now, but just philosophy, uh, what, what humans can learn of God just by their own experience. Um, um, if we could learn to argue about that civilly and present evidence of one and the other to us, we would help each other out. And, and we would each come to different conclusions, no doubt. Um, I think the vast majority would come to the knowledge of God around them and within them because that's the default position of the human race. That's what most people have always done. That's what most people on earth are doing today. Uh, atheism is a relatively sm is small minority, uh, hold it, even agnosticism. And even there you discover, uh, opinion surveys show that one half of all agnostics actually believe in God in the way that Aristotle did, or Plato, or Cicero, or Seneca. Not the Christian God, not the Jewish God, but um, an extraordinary power, and uh, really a governor of the universe in some extraordinary way, paradoxical way often, and a, a great source of the light and intelligence which suffuses all things. Whatever this God is, who, whose energy you see everywhere, he's, he certainly embodies the genius in mathematics because you study everything. It seems to have a, a lend itself to mathematical uh, treatment to an extraordinary and beautiful uh, degree. Well, anyway, uh, and even uh, atheists, uh, about one out of every five, believes in a God like Aristotle and Plato. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, I, I do think that's the default position, but for various reasons, people are looking for a different sort of God, and there are five, six, ten different ideas of God, and most of them just don't work. And if you, if you go seeking those, you're, you're not going to believe in that God for sure. And if you think yourself, all you are is a sack of matter, uh, of chemical, um, you know, inspirited for a while, and then poof, um, your idea of God is going to be very limited too. Um, in short, I think self-knowledge is the key. 
Uh, I look for thee everywhere, my God, St. Augustine wrote, and when I found thee, uh, thou wert within. And I, th I think that's the key today. So as we see a little bit more clearly who we are, we either see that we are participating, living in God, or we're not. And, um, um, and when I say see, you know, it's not the knowledge of the senses. You can't touch God or taste him or see him or hear him. Um, little children do. Um, and uh, people who become religious often feel a great sweetness and joy for a time. But those who are adult in the faith know long periods of dryness and um, desert, as it's often called, when um, they cry out to God and there's no reply. Um, or they ask God and uh, then nothing. Or they approach God and no one appears. Um, common in the biblical period and in all periods of, of human history. So the kind of knowing we have of God is a dark knowing. It's not sense knowledge uh, knowing. Um, but yeah, there it is. It's very strong and very... It just keeps reappearing in human history. The sense of the transcendent, uh, of the numinous, uh, of the sacred. There's a lot more going on in our lives than, uh, you know, than we see at first glance. And the longer we live, the more we see that.